Welcome to Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and we are pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. She is the current City of Grand Prairie Mayor, Jackie Clayton, is coming on to talk about herself, but also her community. Mayor Clayton, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, happy to be here, and the honor is mine. Anytime I have an opportunity to speak about my community, I'm happy to do so. And before we get started with your community, let's talk about yourself first. And my very first question to any politician who comes on this show, and you're no exception to that rule, is where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Mayor Clayton? I would say that it's been a long sort of piece in my soul, a fiber in my being, if you would. Uh, my family growing up was always heavily involved in communities. I grew up in Northwestern BC in a small community called Terrace. And my family was extremely involved in the community, whether it be um, through you know the local um, sporting events, or my dad was heavily involved in you know BC Winter Games and Northern BC Winter Games. And my parents um, were involved in the Legion growing up. And my mom was involved in the local annual uh, riverboat days. And so uh, through sporting events and cultural events, whatever it may be, my family was always very involved. And so from a young age, I, that was just sort of a way of life. So for me, uh, being involved, I always sort of had that entrepreneurial drive, but I also recognized that uh, there was a need for supporting your community. So I truly believe that you can only expect what you want out of your community based on as much as you're willing to give it. So if you give your community lots, you can expect your community to give you lots. And so I really, uh, moving here in 1999, my um, husband and I moved here then for five years and kind of lost track of time. And, and next, before you know it, you get involved in the community and, and they would see you know somebody that wants to volunteer and put their hand up. And as soon as a community that's as engaged as Grand Prairie is, sees somebody who's willing to put their hand up all the time, you end up getting brought into lots of different organizations. So I was a chamber president uh, relatively early in you know 2006, considering I'd only been here um, six years at that point. I got involved in the chamber executive um, in 26 as the president, but had worked on the, um, the board for two years prior worked my way up to be president and uh, through there became involved in many other organizations. The sat as a director on the Arctic Winter Games, sat as a board of governors at what is now known as Northwest Polytech uh, for six years as a board of governor and, and through different organizations, whether it be uh, Communities in Bloom to um, being involved in my children's playground fundraising, whatever that looked like. Um, the more I got involved, the more I knew through my chamber involvement um, it was, I, I think I was pregnant with my first son when I was past chair of the chamber. So, um, yeah, that would have been right because he was born in 27, so, or 2007 rather. I knew that I would eventually get to politics at a municipal level. Um, and, but I knew that my kids needed to be old enough to be able to do that. So, when my boys were eight and six, I decided that it was time for me and ran in my first election. And so, um, now this is my third election and it's where we are today. Was municipal politics always the one that you wanted to get into? Because you could have chosen many different uh, uh, levels, uh, school board, whether it be school board, provincial, federal. But with your resume, and I, I say this with all due respect to you, your resume, you were like uh, keener to get onto municipal politics and get into local government. Was it always local government for you that always made the uh, perfect choice to get involved in, in giving back to that community, as you talked about in your opening statement there? Well, interesting enough, I had uh, business leaders and people that were involved in provincial politics uh, following my time at the chamber, because I also sat on our local utility association board. And so they sort of, you know, were saying, no, you don't want to get into municipal politics. You um, you don't want to take calls of why the garbage man's late and you don't want to take calls of about potholes. You don't want to take those calls. You should really get into provincial politics. And at that time, uh, when my kids were younger, the idea of being in, in Edmonton 100 days a year uh, wasn't really appealing to me. I also truly believe that provincial and federal politicians who have served some time uh, at the municipal level have a far better understanding of um, the importance of municipal politics uh, or politicians. Uh, it is true on a daily basis. I'll get a phone call about potholes or 
playground needs or garbage pickup or things that are really impacting your life on a day-to-day -day basis. If I were to choose to go on to provincial or federal politics in the future, I think that my time served at the municipal level would be um, would have been extremely valuable. Um, I think that on a regular basis, you recognize at a more street level, grassroots level, the day-to-day -day business and, and the, the one step to the provincial politics, a little bit more removed federal politics, another step removed. And, and we're very fortunate in our region. We have excellent serving per, per, provincial and federal politicians. They're very engaged in their communities. They're very knowledgeable of what's going on. Um, but in some areas that's not always so, and, and, and they treat their job really uniquely. And we're very integrated here at all levels of government in Grand Prairie. And I just think that um, if nothing else, my time that I've served at municipal level has been very helpful. Was there an issue that was uh, brought to you or that you uh, wanted to address when you ran for that first election? Because people get into politics for many different reasons, especially on a municipal level, whether it be fixing a certain street or uh, changing the way we collect garbage, they have an issue. Was there an issue for you that you said, you know what, I think we need to address this if I get elected? Well, and it's interesting. You hear a lot of um, business people that get into any level of politics. They think that they that governments can run more like business and that, you know, you get in there and you put your thumbprint on it and you can reduce taxes and be more efficient. And so that was definitely some of my work that was important to me, but also being a chamber president and lobbying on behalf of business, I learned about um, opportunities that are um, that you can have an impact on at a municipal level. So for me, the first year definitely was being community minded and business driven. I thought that those were two good pieces that would in turn make me a good municipal counselor. I still believe on a daily basis that my business experience uh, impacts the decisions I make. Uh, being community minded also impacts decisions you make. So I think that um, people can't be naive when they get into politics in regards to think that they can change things in, in one year. I do think that in a four year term, you can have a lot of impact. I think in a four year, now that municipal politicians are four years rather than three, um, you can actually get substantial work done and you can have an impact. I know last term and leading into the first year of this term, the previous council and this council have kept over five years, you know, a below zero rate of uh, tax increase while the rate of inflation was double digit. So, I mean, there is impacts that you can have. And without, I would argue, having any impact of service, we were able to find efficiencies last term and, and working into this term that really made the organization leaner, more efficient, and therefore more effective for the, the residents of our region. So I do think that Having that business approach uh, is important, and I do think, um, all the though you can't do it overnight, that there is impact that you can have. How do you do that? How do you balance the needs of the few against the needs of the community? Because there are people probably in your community who say their issue is the most important issue on the face of the earth. But you as a mayor and as a council have to look at the bigger picture, have to look at Grand Prairie as a whole. How do you balance that as, a, as someone who has that connections to those communities? So I think that it's important early on when you establish your council strategic priorities, which is built by nine people who represent nine voter population. You know, so nine people are elected by nine presumed different groups in the community. Those nine people come together and build the strategic priorities. If council can stick to their strategic priorities that were initially built by the team, you can make decisions by those guiding principles. I think that if, you know, don't get me wrong, in a four year term, things can pivot. We saw last term that you, you know, you pivot on a dime. And unfortunately, sometimes that takes you off of focus of what your priorities, but when you're forced to, to pivot, you need to be strong enough to make those decisions. I also think that it's really about teaching um, residents the importance of other people's priorities as well. So when you, when you come to me and tell me that, um, a pickleball court is the most important thing in my community. Fair enough, in your opinion, it may be. But I also want you to recognize that the, the library people think that their growth is the most important thing in the community. And, and that the cultural center thinks that their piece is the most important. And the hockey team 
they think they need another uh, rink of ice. So getting the user groups and, and our residents and our, our nonprofits and our organizations to recognize that each other's priorities are equally important. And then for me, it comes down to the nice to haves and the needs to have. I can tell you that our residents need to live in a safe community that has, you know, a way to get to work efficiently, to, to have housing opportunities. And, and those are the needs to have, right? So that you have somewhere to live, you have um, recreation that's affordable. But the nice to haves are that fifth sheet of ice or the second swimming pool or the, you know, those types of things. So it's defining the balance between nice to haves and needs to haves and letting the residents recognize that everybody's priority is important. Did it take you a long time to realize that? Because uh, your first term as someone who is newly elected to council, you probably think you have all the answers to everything, right? You you believe you have the best solutions for how to move forward and how to make sure everyone gets what they want. But the need to have and the nice to haves, you learn that very quickly because you realize once you get into that budget, which is literally about two months after you get elected, that the needs to have the need to have and the want to haves well, you have to make the tough decisions and sometimes you might be angering the people that just elected you. Yeah, and that, it, it's interesting in that first year, right? You're really approving the fourth year of the previous uh, council's budget. So trusting the system is a little bit of a part of it because you can't upset the apple cart overnight. You can't, I mean, you could, I guess if you have four friends and you come in and you can upset it really quickly. But I think that... Uh, recognizing the work and res having respect for the work that the previous council had has done, but also feeling that you're still getting to put your mark on a few things that represent the people that elected you. So if that means coming in and, and, and reducing um, expenditures on certain items because those were priorities to you and you found four friends and you're able to do that, um, that's fine. But it also means in that first year, uh, there typically isn't a lot of change. The other part of it is, is organizationally, I think most municipalities administration is smart enough to make the fourth year of a budget relatively uh, with minimal impact so that you don't get a new council that comes in and upsets everything and, and stops progress that have been already put in motion. So, you know, the fourth year is relatively a light year in most budgets, and that makes that transition easier for the newbies and, and for people coming to council. Was it easy for you for this transition in this last, in the 2021 election, because you were selected by your councillors in 2021 to be the interim mayor because the former mayor stepped down and then you were reelected in 2021 to your first mandate as mayor. Does that give you sort of a better understanding and a better uh, learning curve to direct council moving into this four-year term as your first four-year term? Well, interesting. So I, I refer to me being in term as the longest job interview in history in the worst of times. So um, it, um, although it, it helped me in regards to the operational knowledge, it wasn't coming in for the first day when I was elected, new to the job, not understanding where's who's who, where's what. Because as counselors, we're part time. We're not in the day to day city hall operations. And so it gave me that knowledge. But I truly didn't feel comfortable to sit in the chair, per se, for lack of a better term, because I wasn't elected. I was truly there just to guide the ship, to finish out the time that council had, you know, put their um, priorities and make sure that to chair the meetings, per se, and less directional and more about operational in regards to I'm here to chair the meetings. I'm here to make sure that we don't crash the ship. I'm here to be the conduit between administration and council. And so um, it wasn't really as impactful. Now it's, this is my job. And now it's, it's about leading the priorities of council, making sure that we're getting things done. And, and now it's um, the, it was, it was a good warm up, but it, it's completely different to be honest. I want to turn to the work-life balance because as municipal councillors, you are the frontline politics. Uh, provincially, they're in Edmonton. You may have a larger area to represent. Federally, you're in Ottawa and you have a much larger area to represent. But you make decisions based on uh, what you are presented. You, uh, you are making decisions on water prices, ga uh, garbage pickup, and then you have to go grocery shopping. 
And I can imagine being from even a community like Grand Prairie, which I've been to many times, and I know it's a very large community, but it still has that small town feel, even though it is a city, you will hear the decisions you make at the grocery store and you will have people probably come up to you on a regular basis and say, why did you make a decision on this and this? How do you balance that in a community like yours? I think that because I've been involved in the community so for so many years and heavily involved and, and you know, been seen to have been somebody who puts my hand up, gets engaged, that I um, people know me well enough to know um, when's a good time to approach and when's not. Don't get me wrong, there's, there's, you may be having dinner with your family and somebody comes up and says, hey, I just, you know, I, I sorry to interrupt, but I just want to pick your brain on this. And, and I have no problem saying, you know what, I'm ha ha absolutely happy to talk to you, but if it can wait, can you call my cell? Here's my number, call me on Monday, shoot me a text, whatever. I'm, I'm really um, accessible, but I'm, I think it's also for people to understand that you still have to have that balance, like you say. I also expect that anytime I go out in public, that I'm gonna run into somebody. So when I was a counselor, maybe I had to run to Home Depot and get a can of paint. I didn't really care if I went with no makeup and my sweatpants. And now I make sure that I'm always ready for work because any given day, it could be somebody that would, hey, it's Mayor so-and-so. Like we have over a hundred Ukrainians that have moved to our community. I run into, somebody through through Rotary who is with the Ukrainians like wants to meet the man and they want to take a picture. So, you know, you just, you get into sort of a different circumstance. But uh, I think that generally, in my opinion, our community is very respectful. Um, we, they're cognizant of the, she's working and she's not, but people do have, they may not run into me in a normal situation. So they see you at the grocery store and they want to stop. Uh, but generally, it's a, it's pretty respectful. I often wonder though, is it because I'm a female? Is it because they're, they're less likely to stop me in the grocery store because they know I'm a mom out getting the groceries. And then it's like, whereas a guy, they might just assume has more time. I always wonder that, you know, if, if, if the female in the family is the grocery shopper, do they assume that you don't have time? Whereas the man, oh, there's a partner in the family, they have an opportunity to be at the kids. So, you know, I always wonder if it's, if I get less harassment because I'm a female. Do, 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 has your family adjusted to your work life? Because well, I can imagine it, being out at dinner and people keep on coming up. I, yeah. I can imagine as a kid, I'd be going, mom, can't we just have a regular family dinner where no one bothers us? Well, and on many occasions, like tomorrow, my youngest son's school is having the official grand opening. And so it's, you know, it's a big deal. It's a brand new high school. It it's, it's, has capacity for 2,500 students. It's, it's a significant um, addition to our inventory of high schools. And, and I, I told him I'm going there and I made a joke that I was going to do a shout out to him. And he's like, mom, that is not okay. He's in grade 10. And he's like, and he seriously gets worried about it for a more, for a moment. And I'm like, no, of course I'm not going to, but, and then my other son's in grade 12 and I'm like, I'll be at your graduation ceremony on the stage. And he's like, okay, that's going to be weird, right? So those real life experiences that impact your children on a day-to-day -day basis. Also during COVID, I made decisions as an elected official that impacted my family. And, and for example, I was advised, it was, we were supposed to go to Sun Peaks to go skiing in BC. And I was advised, don't leave the province. It's probably not good. And uh, if I wasn't an elected official, I probably would have gone because it's more about the, leading by example concern right and so we didn't go and my kids are like if you weren't the mayor then you know what i mean so there's those kind of considerations for you, sure. you you opened up pandora's box so i'll play in it for a few yeah. seconds if you're okay how did the city of grand prairie handle the covid19 pandemic because with all due respect we're coming out of it i think we are still in some of it i just got over covid19 i had it for a week and a half and i it is a terrible thing to have but how did the city of grand prairie handle it uh, we're a very diverse community, so I would say, I'll say we handled it um, as good as any community could, um, but the sentiment through emails and on the street was very divided. Um, any given day, we you'd get 50 emails regarding the COVID and they'd be split down the middle, you know, you need to protect us more, you need, you need to leave us alone. It was very, very divided. 
Um, and so how did you deal as, with it? How did you deal with a divided community? Because I'm, I apologize for interrupting, but I can imagine that was probably the hardest decisions that you may, had to make. Because, like you said, you had the longest job interview yes. uh, of uh, being in the worst mayor of in the worst of times. So, how did you balance that with your fellow councillors? Well, I, I think that council um, tended to be very strong at making tough decisions, um, and and they really just kept to receiving information and, and making decisions based on as much information as they could get. There was decisions, you know, obviously that aren't municipal level decisions that we needed the province's support on. There was decisions in, that we were able to have a little better impact. I think that we kept our community um, as safe as we could with as much information as we could get from the province. And so at any given day, uh, there may people may have been people that thought we should have been stricter, but there was also as equally um, as many people that thought we should re lift things sooner than the province was. So we really used the, the information from the healthcare professionals as best we could, and in turn um, interpreted that to information that helped our community be, you know, still continue to operate. And, and I think we were a pretty good balance. I think um, there were communities that were stricter. Um, we sort of traditionally followed the province's um, path in regards to sticking with their dates, sticking with their expectations. We didn't go above and beyond the province's expectations. We also uh, didn't um, open up any sooner than the province. So we followed their lead and, and best got that information, provided support where we could in our community through grants and, and implementation of, of um, getting PPE to, to organizations and, and hosting a vaccination, um, uh, large scale vaccination clinic in one of our facilities so that people that wanted to get vaccinated could. And so we provided the opportunity for people, regardless of what their opinion was, people that wanted the opportunity for vaccination and, and information, people that didn't want it, we didn't force it down their throat. Strategic Steps works with local municipalities, boards, and school divisions across Canada, providing guidance and expertise in governance, strategy, and sustainability. They work with clients to build on existing strengths, develop recommendations that are practical, sustainable, and strategic, and lead professional development sessions that drive organizational excellence and council and board member growth. From strategic planning to organizational and governance reviews to governance workshops and more, Strategic Steps has the tools, experience, and expertise to help your organization reach its goals and set itself up for future success. To book a consultation or learn more about Strategic Steps Incorporated, visit strategicsteps.ca today. I, I want to turn to Grand Prairie as a whole now, and this is the, 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 the big crux of the municipal month that we're doing. And I want to ask, and I, before I ask this question, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a conversation between me, Chris Brown, and the mayor of the city of Grand Prairie. This is her opinion, not a decision made by council. This is just her opinion, and it's just a conversation between the two of us. Mayor Clayton, what is the biggest issue, in your opinion, that is facing the city of Grand Prairie today? Uh, I would think that the biggest issue facing the community today, it, it, I mean, it's definitely different on any, depending who you're talking to. Right now, the one that I personally am hearing about is in regards to um, the healthcare crisis that we're facing. I think that um, there are many issues in the healthcare system right now. We have a brand new regional hospital with, you know, it's the fifth cancer um, clinic in the, in the province, the, the only one north of Edmonton. Um, and it, it's an amazing, beautiful facility. It, um, it's being under operationalized. It's, um, we're losing um, healthcare professionals um, because of, um, we're hearing various reasons. And so myself, I don't even have a GP anymore. And so we're, we're in a healthcare shortage of uh, physicians and healthcare professionals, like many communities. The problem is, is that we just opened this brand new regional hospital. So it's not just the city of Grand Prairie's problem, it's the region's problem. And, and when we're hearing um, issues on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's, um, it's concerning, it's frustrating, it's scary at points. 
And I think that that's, and it's not a municipal issue. You know, I mean, we can do what we can. And, but at the end of the day, this, we don't run the healthcare organization. This isn't our bucket to fix. While it's not your bucket to fix, it's your community that's being affected by this. Exactly. Um, I know municipalities, I, I used to work in Northern Alberta, so I, I know the healthcare issue is very prominent up there. What is the city of Grand Prairie trying to do to help alleviate some of these issues right now? Because while, like you said, it is a provincial issue, you can't just pass the buck and say, well, it's not our issue, so we're not going to try and fix it. You have to try and help with your elected MLAs and your provincial government to try and figure out a solution to represent the people of Grand Prairie. So how is the council doing that? Yeah, absolutely. On, on many levels, we're helping. We, um, for example, I'm going to a dinner tonight with fourth year residents and, and, and we continually work through U of A and U of C to talk to the residents, to teach them about the North, to tell them about the opportunities and get them familiar with our area. Typically, like myself, when you move here, um, you stay longer than you plan. You don't, there's very seldom, you're either from Grand Prairie, I always say, or you moved here for five years and never left. There's very few people I ever meet that say, I'm on my fourth year, five years, and I'm out here next year. I can't wait. It's truly people come here for work or they're from here. And most of the time, once they get here, they don't leave. So we're um, working through UC and U of A to get the residents more familiar with our region. We also, um, anytime AHS is, has a new doctor or specialist considering moving here, I'm happy to tour them myself. I take them, depending on the composition of their family or their personal needs, I'll take them to our largest recreation facility. I show them the opportunities in retail. I show them the opportunities in culture and just really from a mayor's perspective, get them acquainted with our community. And, and many times I have people that will say, I've never been I've never been toured, never mind by the mayor. So I'm happy to do that stuff. I think it's really important and it makes a big impact. You know, it's interesting. We also uh, were looking at a strategic opportunity. Um, we advocate obviously with Minister Copping and, and uh, associate ministers on a regular basis, but we're looking, what is our role? Is Does it mean that we have to take a larger role, a financial you know, uh, role in that in regards to incentivizing, um, working with residents, what that looks like. So we're looking at those opportunities. I do think though that at some level, other municipalities across the province are taking a larger role in it. And we are at that stage where we're talking about it. It's this healthcare crisis as I'm calling it um, has really only risen to the top recently. I think that still right there behind it would be homelessness and mental health support. Um, you know, as a as a municipality, we it's been at the forefront last term and, and we've really taken some aggressive, progressive and and I think um, state of the art sort of decisions to help with that. But we also with that comes uh, safety and and my first two terms, safety was the number one concern of communities in our recent engagement with with, with uh, our residents, it's dropped to number four. And so dropping to number four, I think is is great work. But if statistically your community is safer, it doesn't mean that people feel safer. So there's still pieces in there that are important. And last but not least with that, in regards to the number one priority prior to that sort of healthcare mental health bucket until recently was utility rates and, and the transmission and distribution rates to Northern communities. And so those issues are similar across the province, but in our municipality, and we just did a, a resolution last week at AU, uh, AB Muni's about it. In our region, the average house will pay $1,300 in distribution rates. In Edmonton and Calgary, the average house pays about 550. So those things are significant in our community. I, I want to I wanna piggyback on that last statement that you just said there, because affordability is an issue that's facing a lot of Albertans and a lot of Canadians right now. And you talk about uh, Northern living, particularly distribution rates and $1,300 seems like a lot. And mm -hmm. I, and I used to live in Northern Alberta in a small town and I know those distribution fees can be higher than the actual fees for electricity themselves. What is the city of Grand Prairie doing to help alleviate some of this affordability issue right now? Because uh, most people who listen to this, who might be from Toronto or Calgary or Saskatoon, 
affordability is an issue that's on the top of their minds. But when you live in remote communities like the city of Grand Prairie, where you have to drive three hours to Edmonton to go uh, catch a plane, if you're not catching a plane from the city of Grand Prairie Airport to Edmonton, affordability in northern communities is a lot tougher than say cities and i i mean that with respect to the people of cities but how are how is the city of grand prairie handling the affordability crisis as the urban center like the largest urban center in northern alberta right we really have everything you need we're very fortunate right we have you a do. regional you airport <laughs> that you know you know a regional airport that flies uh to calgary and edmonton and and we have every amenity we provide not only serviced by four industries, you know, forestry, agriculture, oil and gas. We also are the service hub, whether it be for professional services, for healthcare, for retail. So we really are that regional hub. And I think that affordability, um, we know that the average person is paid slightly more in this region. The average family income is higher here. Um, but that doesn't mean that because you make more money that it should have to cost you more. If you move to the North, Maybe you want to take that opportunity to retire earlier or to invest your money into things. So just because you've chosen to live in the north and to make more money, why should that be taken away from you by the cost of living? So in regards to distribution, um, you're right. On an average utility bill, um, it can be 75% of the bill. In the city of Grand Prairie alone, we pay about $3.8 million in distribution. That's 75% of our total power bill. And so we've been working hard and I've had really good conversations as of late with the providers, with, with what that looks like. And the providers seem to be on board because they don't want their organization to look inexpensive. They wanna grow their businesses, so they need to look affordable. So it's really advocating, um, getting our resolution passed last week at the um, Alberta municipalities at 85% of, of the membership passed it. Uh, in November, the same resolution is going to uh, RMA, the Royal Municipality Association. And because of this, it really becomes a provincial issue. But I was really excited to hear um, in the last two weeks that industry wants to work with us and support these resolutions. And I think that that's a, a big win. So if we have industry and municipalities, we just need to find this solution. And I know it's hard for the urban centers, Edmonton and Calgary in particular, but it's not about it being equal. That's what I remind people. This is not about bringing the, the 1300 and balancing it so that we're equal because we understand that there's large transmission distances between these communities, but we still believe that it can be closer. And so if the average and, and, and provinces such as BC and Saskatchewan have figured that out. So there's no reason that we can't figure it out. At $7 a month, per house in Edmonton and Calgary. So if every house in Edmonton and Calgary paid $7 a month more, they'd be equal. So imagine if every household in Edmonton and Calgary paid $3 more, it would be, you know, and so for you to pay $36 more on your house in Edmonton and Calgary to support an area that has the largest natural gas play that in turn goes back for the power generation is what, makes Alberta better, right? We're all together in this. And it's not about making it equal. I choose to live four hours north of, of the largest majors, you know, of, a, the, the, of the capital of my province. So I get that everything may not be accessible. It, some things may be a little bit more expensive, but they can be closer. Oh, sorry, you're muted. I apologize. I coughed and I muted myself there. No worries. I, I want to ask one last question in this segment, then I want to turn to the last one because I'm just cautious of time here. And yeah. that is you are, uh, and I say you is the Royal you as in the city of Grand Prairie is are currently operating with a, uh, uh, not a full council. On October 17th, you have a by-election coming up to elect a new councillor. Um, this is going to potentially uh, not change drastically the makeup of council, but it will be a new voice on the council. Um, there will be a lot of a learning curve for that new councillor. Are you looking forward to being back to full strength in uh, council chambers around the table where you have the full weight of council talking about issues? Well, it's interesting. Um, as of late, a few residents had said, why are you doing this? You know, it's not inexpensive to hold a by-election. It's obviously um, demanding on administration and internally. And, and, and 
people understand that we lost a counselor and 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 just to to mention that we lost a great counselor. He was an engineer. He had been a chair of the House Super Board. He'd been a nine-year school board trustee chair. He was a huge part of our council. And so it, it, it's a big hole to fill. Um, the MGA, uh, people don't understand, will not let us operate with eight counselors. We did lose a counselor last term, but there was, uh, he, um, Councillor Blackburn unfortunately passed with cancer, but he only passed with about uh, eight months left, 10 months left. So it was a much shorter window. So the Ministry of uh, Municipal Affairs was fine with us not filling that. But with three years left in the term, we just simply can't do that. We have to fill this. And it is expensive and it, it is time consuming and demanding of our team. And, and you are right, it will change. Right now, it's still the same team with missing council learners. One person changes the um, the dynamics, the direction, the, the conversation significantly. And although they're coming in really on October 17th with a pretty steep learning curve, you know, the middle of November, we go into five days of budget deliberation. If they have not been around the table, because there are some counselors that are running that have been around the table, if they've not been around the table before, their learning curve will be even larger and steeper. And so I think that all the candidates running are really engaged, which is great to see. Um, they're really knowledgeable. And other than one um, who's involved in different ways, they've either ran before or been in government. So that helps a bit. But you're right. It'll change significantly. I'm, um, I'm looking forward to seeing who the new person is. But it's back to what we talked about when you're in your first year and approving that fourth year budget. You have to... Um, trust the process a little bit and have a little bit of respect for the people that made those decisions and have had been working in the last year to why those priorities are there. Hopefully some of those priorities align with the new counselor as well. And you can sort of, they fit in a little better that way. They may not fit into every sort of item of, of interest or, or topic of interest, but they'll fit in somewhere because I think we did a great job in our strategic plan and it really serves our community well. So they should find some points of interest and in some areas that they're comfortable. They you, you, must be remember, watching, you must be watching the race because yeah. you're, you're, you're expecting to swear in this next uh, yeah. counselor. Um, are the council candidates talking about different issues that you go, oh, I didn't think this was an issue that people are talking about, but I'm glad this issue is being brought to the forefront by candidate X or candidate B or candidate Y, because at the end of the day, they'll be able to advocate it for it on council on October 18th when they're, well, or the next council meeting after the votes are uh, certified, uh, they'll be able to advocate for that issue. Yeah, I'm not seeing a ton of, new things but what i'm seeing is that their interpretation of some of the work we're doing or their priorities with a different lens and so i think that that's really important they will um have their own priorities they also they all seem very engaged so they understand our priorities and i'm seeing um them digest it and 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 communicate it through a different lens and i think that's important the other thing that the new elected officials have to understand is that Although the budget will be a steep learning curve and they'll come at them really quickly, that doesn't mean that they won't have an opportunity for impact. Every, you know, the four year budget will touch different points, but it'll also, all those decisions still at some point come back to council for discussion. So it's not like they won't have an opportunity to put their fingerprint on something. So they, um, but it's more about the process of setting the, the guidelines for administration to be able to carry out the priorities. So I, you know, I think that we're seeing it's great to see eight candidates in a municipal by-election. I mean, it just goes to show the interest of, um, and, the, and I take it as they're excited to work with this council because this is, in my opinion, the best council I've seen in four terms or three terms rather. And I'm really excited about somebody new coming in and adding their flavor and, and, and that kind of thing. But I, I think they're just, I see it as a positive that they're really excited to be part of this team. Well, hello. This is your friendly host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I have some big news for you. I am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with Strategic Steps Incorporated to launch a brand new show on October 19th. The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments and we will have a 
roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the news show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into the political trenches. I appreciate that, uh, Mayor. Clayton, and I want to turn to my last segment here because I, I'm cautious of time and I have about 10 minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask a very poignant question to you. And this yeah. is my favorite question that I ask all the uh, municipal councillors and mayors, and that is, what makes the city of Grand Prairie such a unique place? You know, it, it may sound cliche, but it's definitely the people. Uh, we have incredible sunsets. We have long days in the summer. In the winter, we have sunny blue skies and all those things are great, but the people are really, I think, why people like me who came here for five years stay. I mean, you move to a northern community, you're not staying for the winter. You know, you're not staying because you like the minus 20 in January or the minus 30, the wind chill in February. You're staying because the people are inclusive. You're staying because the people, the region provides everything you need here. We really, as this hub of the north, provide everything you need. Um, but the people are just so unique. I think that per capita, we have the most giving community in Canada, whether it be financial contributions or volunteer contributions. We pride ourselves in the fact that we're a game city. We're hosting the 2024 Winter Alberta Winter Games, and, and you know they need 2,000 volunteers for that. And I know they'll get them. Then we're also going to host the Special Olympics potentially in summer. And we're looking at the Alberta Indigenous Games the following year. And so we really like to bring people to this community because when they get here, they have no idea what a great place it is. And I hosted 23 Mid-Size City Mayors here in May, toured them in our facilities. One of the mayors said to me, you are a mid-sized city with big city amenities, big city issues, and big city mentality. We shoot above our weight on a daily basis, whether it's in our nonprofits, in our organizations, in the services we provide, or the amenities that we have. So I just really think that we, um, but that's driven by the people. Their entrepreneurial spirit is second to none. And they really just take pride in what this community is and, and, and living here. People are proud to be Grand Prairie uh, residents. And on a daily basis, the people that I talk to are just really happy with this region and what it provides for people. So I really think what's unique comes down to the people. We have listeners from across this great country, across this great province and around the world. Um, if I was a tourist coming to your community tomorrow, what are some of the highlights? And I know that asking a mayor to pick and choose her favorite places is always hard, but I'm gonna put you on the spot here. What are some of the spots that a tourist should visit while in the city of Grand Prairie? Well, it's interesting. If you were coming in the summer, I would say you got to get outside and enjoy the late, the long days, right? So whether it was golfing or we have an incredible network of tra uh, trail network that goes from one end of the city to the other and, and, and now has been approved to connect with our county and our rural, with our rural neighbors. And so I think we have more paved walking trails per capita than any city in Canada, something we need to be proud of. And in the summer and the winter, they're accessible. We also have Alberta's second largest art gallery, second behind the provincial art gallery. So it's really something that we're proud of. And it's attached to our library and also has a community hall attached to it. We um, also have a facility that had, is attached. It's called the Community Knowledge Camp Campus that is twin ice rinks, two high schools, a Catholic and a public, as well as a gymnast facility and a running track, a skating rink, a wave pool, a field house. So we really just have great amenities. So whether you wanna go skiing in the winter or play golf in the summer, we have great things. Whether you're, if you're a cultural buff, we have that for you too. So I think there's a lot of great um, tourism pieces. And the one that we often forget about being based in the city is our dinosaur museum. You know, 20 minute drive away, second largest dinosaur museum behind the Royal Terrell. And really um, the dinosaur bone bed in our region, in my opinion, is second to none. And they're continually, it's a live working bone bed. They're finding dinosaur bones on a regular basis. So there's really, whether you like art galleries, whether you like dinosaurs, whether you like golfing, whether you like 
you know, mountain biking, cross, uh, cross country biking, we really have it all. So it's really just a great community to satisfy a family, an individual. Um, there's lots of opportunity for you here to enjoy our region. So it's hard to pinpoint one. But I'm, I'm going to I'm going to ask this question to end uh, Mayor Clayton, and that is after a stressful day, after a long council meeting, after a, just a meet, meeting upon meeting upon meeting, what's the one place in Grand, the city of Grand Prairie that you can go to and just decompress? Is it your home? Is it a park? Is it a playground? Is it just a walking trail? What's the one place that you go to decompress in the city? For sure. I think that uh, a combination of things. We have great hospitality in our in our city in regards to great coffee shops, great restaurants, you know, a place to have a, a glass of wine, a place to have a great steak, whatever that looks like. So it's sometimes that. But I think that for me, because I live in the heart of the city and, and the access to trails for me is literally in my backyard. It's the trails, you know, grab my dog and get on the trails and and go for a walk. Um, I think that's a, and that's for a lot of people. The, the activity in our trails is significant. So for me, it's the um, embracing that. Uh, but it's also about recreation. I, you know, I play golf in the summer. I ski with my family in the winter. I played a lot of competitive sports, um, including college basketball growing up. So it's about doing something active, um, but yeah, as well as enjoying the cultural amenities um, and culinary amenities that our city has for sure. Well, Mayor Clayton, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I, I appreciate taking time out of your busy schedules to sit down and talk about yourself, but also your community. I much appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. I really, I can't believe how quick the time went. So thank you for that. And I'm happy to do it. Uh, give me a show at any time. Will do. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our democracy, helps our society. It makes us a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember everyone, keep talking. Thank you.